In many of the films now being made, there is very little cinema. They are mostly what I call photographs of people talking. When we tell a story in cinema, we should resort to dialogue only when it's impossible to do otherwise. I always try to tell a story in the cinematic way, through a succession of shots and bits of film in between. If it's a good movie, the sound could go off and the audience would still have a perfectly clear idea of what is going on. Indeed, let me give you some examples. Mildred Pierce is a 1945 American film noir crime drama. Mildred is, has a wealthy husband which leaves her for another woman. And then Mildred decides to raise her two daughters on her own. Now, despite having some financial success in restaurant business, she starts to waitress and her oldest daughter, 16-year-old spoiled social climber named Veda, resents her mother for degrading their social status. They have a complicated relationship and it gets even more complicated when they both get attracted to an older man called Monte. And eventually, it ends in Monte being murdered. By the end of the film, Mildred reveals her story to the police officer in her flashbacks. I want to examine the ending of this particular film noir because I want to teach you and inspire you to use the lighting more effectively in your storytelling. We will examine some screenshots from the film. We start with a shot where there is only a silhouette of a person that looks like is wearing fur coat and fur hat. We can assume it's a woman. The back wall behind her is not completely white, it is instead filled with interesting shadows of its own, adding to the atmosphere and the visual interest of the shot. The next shot is obviously the continuation of the first, but this time not only is the character approaching the camera, therefore filling the frame, but she is partly being revealed, with a slice of light across her left shoulder and her chest. As audience, we are still partly kept in the dark, pun intended. This is a masterclass of visual storytelling. Remember what Gordon Willis, the cinematographer, he said, you are not only author of visual aesthetics, meaning you are not only painting nice pictures, you are also a visual psychologist, making the audience see and feel what you want them to see and feel, painting pictures in the dark. Here, we see another master at work, choosing his paintbrushes very carefully and deliberately. In the very next few frames, we finally see the mystery woman entering close-up, filling in the frame. Her face and gesture revealed, we can read from her gesture, her facial expression, that she is surprised by what she sees, off-frame somewhere. You know, they say that the good photograph is knowing where to stand, and the close-up shot is perfectly appropriate here. It's important moment for her, and so the big close-up explains that. The closer someone is to the camera, the more important the shot, the more important is what they have to tell us. Okay, so we have been given enough information with the help of framing, gesture, and of course lighting so that we don't have much more to learn from camera staying focused on her. Now we want to learn about what is she looking at, what is she sneaking up on, and what is giving her such a surprised facial expression. And yes, of course, we might have guessed. We see two new characters, and they too are caught by surprise. We notice once again that the cinematographer Ernest Haller and the director Michael Curtiz choose very carefully where to place the lights. Remember, I remarked upon how it's often more important what you don't light than what you do light. Probably you are starting to understand why that statement was made. It's not that we don't light important things. It's more about strategically withholding information for the purposes of more potent storytelling. Notice how much depth there is in the scene as well. The bar stool, being closer to us, helps 
with a sense of depth, for it represents foreground. Then we have a bar and the two characters in the middle ground, and finally, the wall in the background. And these close blinds forming rich lines and texture add to visual interest of the whole scene. Also, notice the placement of the two characters, adding to the rich dynamics in the frame. Not only does it imply they were about to get very cozy with each other, but also notice how their outfits contrast each other, creating natural visual separation. His black tuxedo versus her bright cocktail dress. Devil is in the details. The next frame finally gives us that important bit of new information. Their faces finally facing light, revealing to the audience two new bits of information. We can immediately notice, by looking at them, that he is older and she is younger. I'll let you work out what that means on your own. What else do we notice? Look at their faces. We humans are good readers of gestures, especially facial expressions, and this is why gesture in your art is such a potent element. She looks both surprised that they were caught and also ready to defend her actions. And he looks like this is not his first time and remains somewhat cold. In the following frames, both characters fill in the frame as the camera gets in closer. As audience, of course, we are expecting for them to have something important to say, and so tighter frame follows that expectation. We don't care about the background at this point, we have seen it, we know where they are. Now we care about what they have to say for themselves. Therefore, framing of the shot mirrors our expectations. This is good storytelling, my friends. Knowing what information the audience already has, and anticipating what they expect. Additionally, notice the subtle differences in how much light there is on her versus him. She is about to be the one doing the speaking, and so she is a bit more brightly lit, telling the audience that subconsciously they should be both watched, but she is the one that is about to speak, so get ready. It's a conscious decision to light and frame the shot this way but the reaction of the audience in all likelihood will be subconscious. And that is the way it should be. You want to influence people subconsciously because you want them to keep the focus on the story, not the technique. Technique should always hide itself modestly behind the thing expressed. Now we are backing off the close-up again, and this time we have a shot with all three characters in the frame, confronting each other. And that is what filmmakers give us here. This is a very good choice to make for several reasons. We have seen both sides independently, and now that we have information on both sides, we are seeing all of them in one frame, but not as a close-up. This is a good decision because after all the initial tension, it gives the audience a bit of break, some breathing room. First, let's look at the placement of figures in the scene, as well as the other objects. I really love the decisions being made here. The main character is seen standing with her back turned to us, because she is not the one delivering the speech in this shot. On the opposite side of the frame, to her left, we see partly visible door frame. This is a really important decision in my opinion, because it helps to frame the other two characters and gives us a sense of spatial awareness. We now know she is still near the door, but from a visual point of view, this vertical line also helps to ground the character. She is standing her ground and that one vertical frame of the door parallel to her helps emphasize that. You don't believe me? Here, let's crop the image so that we don't see the door frame. It's not a huge change, but it is different, isn't it? It's now one against two while with the frame, it's almost as if there is another presence, two against two. Choosing to leave the door frame inside the frame of the picture, psychologically it helps to anchor the character, while visually it helps to act as a part of the frame through which we can see the other two characters and into the space of the room. Along with the door frame, pay attention to the stool once again. 
and also pay attention to the spacing of the figures in the frame and their location within the frame. As a rule of thumb, we, Homo sapiens, have a tendency to read images from left to right, and we also have a tendency to react to bright areas of the frame first. Assuming that is true for most of us, then we would start to read the image from the brightest point in the frame, starting on the left-hand side, which would be the beta character. Next, we see the figure to her left, Monte, and we also notice the facial expressions. He is avoiding eye contact, but she is looking at Mildred, her mother, all the way across the room with great sense of focus and intensity, I might add, promoting us, the audience, to follow her line of sight to the figure with back turned to us. In between these two figures, we see this bar stool, a brightly lit object in between two dark objects. Now, I can't be sure if the stool was brightly lit this way on purpose or it was simply a matter of being hit with a light source that was already lighting the room. However, I'm pretty sure that it was placed there and framed that way on purpose. It just feels right. It serves a purpose of giving some contrast between the objects in the frame. Dark, bright, and dark again, like checkerboard. After all, there is no color in the grayscale frame, so dark against light and light against dark is the name of the game. That is how you paint in the dark. Speaking of dark against light and light against dark, here is something that you might have not noticed at first, but after I point it out to you, it will be difficult for you to forget it. Have you noticed the edge light or rim light on her fur coat? Is it supposed to be there? In a few shots before, when she enters the room and stands in pretty much the same place, it appears to be missing, but now it's here. So why is it here? Even though it breaks the continuity between the shots, it's important brushstroke, because it helps to define the outline of that particular figure. If we were to somehow magically photoshop it away, like so, we would see the problem. Without the edge light to define the outline of that person, she would simply blend into the dark background and with it her presence would be less noticeable and less important. The edge light then was a brushstroke of a genius. It really helps to define the presence of the figure inside the frame. And it also helps to add visually a sense of depth to the space inside the scene. Even though it technically breaks the continuity between the scenes, it's not by mistake, because artistically speaking, it enhances the image, helping the audience have a better experience. Besides, the audience is probably going to be caught up in the drama between the characters interacting with each other and too distracted to notice a thing like that. Never be afraid to do something like that. Bend the rules if you have to. It will help the overall experience. The next frame is another close-up of the main character because we want her facial expression to help us judge what her reaction is to what she is hearing. Relatability via gesture, a powerful storytelling tool. This close-up then is followed by another close-up, except on the other side, mirroring the intensity of the interaction between the two women reaching climax. See how close-ups can help with that, as the importance of what someone has to say or see, framing it is tighter and tighter, visually saying to audience, this, this is important. Of course, unlike the previous close-up, in this one we see two figures, one closer to the lens, appearing larger in the frame than the other. This is a way to visually capture who is more important at that moment. Her or him? Him or her? He is not as important right now, but he is important. So we see them both in the frame. I also like the added gesture of puffing that cigar, gesturing the pressure he feels even if he is not actually saying anything. The actor is gesturing how his character is feeling. Vera is saying Monte will leave Mildred and marry her. 
Once the speech is done, we see a shift back to our main character and her reaction to it. But only this time the crop is not so tight, signaling that what happens next is important. But after initial shock and followed confrontation, tensions have subsided a bit. This also helps the audience get a second to breathe and digest everything they just experienced. Once again, by visually influencing the audience and anticipating their reactions, the filmmakers here tell their story in expert way. Mildred gestures as if she is reaching in her back pocket for what implies to be a gun. Monte quickly reacts and jumps in to grab her. Now, it's his turn to try to patch the situation and he confronts her. Look at the angle and the framing here. Angle is slightly below her eye level, but they are both in profile to us. We as audience are right in there with them and by this time the filmmakers have our complete attention. Look at the gesture and the lighting here. They're both intensely staring at one another, we know why, and he is making a gesture by holding her in firm grasp to prevent her from doing something impulsive like shooting him with a gun. The light is highlighting his right hand, grabbing her arms, and we also see these pools of light on their faces, enhancing the drama. They're in focus, but the background is slightly out of focus. Background is here to provide spatial context and contrast for the outline of the figures. But leaving nothing to change, we also see a bit of edge light as well, subtle but significant. And finally, we see over-the-shoulder close-up with reaction of desperate woman feeling betrayed as we hear the pistol being dropped and hitting the hard wooden floor. She turns around and full of tears storms outside the room. We see now Veda standing in the room, well-lit, thinking she won, and Monte in the dark, feeling he lost. He is quickly walking to the stairs to see and look up behind the woman he just lost. Few steps later, standing in the marked place where the pool of light shines on his face, and only his face, we see the expression of someone feeling he just lost something he shouldn't. At the same time, Veda walks after him in a hurry, stepping in the dark part of the room herself. See how lighting is amplifying here visually what the inner feelings are of the characters, their fears and their desires. This was all well rehearsed in advance by everyone, so here again we see her stepping on the specifically marked spot in the room, so that the light is hitting her from the appropriate angle. Veda here is uncertain about who Monte really wants, so the light is almost splitting her face in light and shade, slightly more in the shade, while she waits to see her, his, his reaction. She is in doubt, insecure about the potential outcome. Lighting is there to represent the internal turmoil, visually, and he of course is not completely in dark, but we only get the edge light on the front side of the, his face, just enough to see his reaction. He says that he will not marry the younger woman, despite her hopes. So she comes close to him and asks, why is he joking like that? He says, I'm not joking, I'm not gonna marry you, you're crazy. Once again, light adds to the interaction by casting him in the shadows as the one breaking the heart and her still not sure about his true intentions, is in doubt but uncertain, and that's what the light reflects. She still has some hope left. And he is walking out of the house here to chase after the other woman, so she tries to stop him by stepping in front of him and both being in bad situation, they're cast into the darkness. This situation is getting darker and darker by the minute, both literally and figuratively. Mildred, the main character, is outside in the car, desperate to go away from all this, but the car won't start and she starts to cry. Meanwhile, upon hearing that she is effectively dumped, the little social climber, Veda, in a fit of jealous rage, uses the gun, introduced earlier, to shoot Monte. 
Again, look at the brilliance of lighting here. Subtle edge light and the rest is cast in the darkness. Just like the dark and jealous mind of the one pulling the trigger. We see Monte bent as he is shot in the chest and stomach. And we see Shooter waiting for the six shooter to run out of bullets. Ending with a close up of her face full of rage and jealousy. Still squeezing the trigger while we are audience can only hear fire pin hitting empty chamber. As Monte collapses on the floor, Veda throws the gun next to his body, I guess hoping that maybe she can frame him. Mildred quickly goes back into the house upon hearing gunshots and asks what happened. Veda quickly produces crocodile tears and sobbing face. She tells the story of how he mocked her and she snapped. Now he won't be laughing anymore, she says. Mildred phones the police. Veda pleads for another chance. At the police station later on, they issue their statements and Veda is arrested. Again, look at the lighting in this scene. I love how the characters are placed in the scene, but I especially like how unnamed, faceless police officer that is about to take away Veda in the background and is just a dark, shadowy figure. Even as Veda is taken away, the officer is just dark figure. But now so is Veda, dark cloud hanging over her. And as they say their goodbyes and last words, the dark lighting trend continues. But lighting is never random, never out of control. Just look at those carefully placed rim lights or edge lights, making sure that we have just enough information to know where and who is in the scene, while the whole scene is dark covered in a particular mood. Just as the psychologically demanding scene would require. After all, this is film noir. And one rule of film noir is make it any color as long as it's black. And besides, film noir as a genre rarely, if ever, has a happy ending. What I wanted to show you with the sequence of frames is how lighting can be so much more. It can imply what is inside the head of the characters as much as revealing their physical presence. Always remember that you are not only the author of visual aesthetics, but also a visual psychologist, as well as the artist painting pictures in the dark.